All right, so I will start today with a topic that is somehow the center of attention at the moment, although um, th this particular topic is not the center of attention, its object is the center of attention. And I would like to talk about the glycan shield. The glycan shield is the expression that is used to um, explain what's going on at the surface of some viruses. So if you take the flu virus or the HIV virus, these are, uh, sorry, I should quote that these are the, um, the drawings of the resource, which is called viral zone. Uh, it's a SIB resource developed um, by uh, Philippe Lemercier, a colleague at SIB. And uh, if you don't know it, I advise you to check it out. It's very, it's an encyclopedia of uh, viruses, really very interesting. So I borrowed the pictures from uh, his encyclopedia. And if you think of the hemagglutinin at the surface of the flu virus, which is uh, of course here and repeated, um, the uh, actual situation is that the, the spike, the, this um, hemagglutinin is covered with glycan and there are six, four to six potential uh, endling sites. And what is actually interesting is that they vary with time. And so uh, you can see here that since 1918, when they have samples from the time and they have uh, um, I'm not absolutely sure how they map the, uh, the, the glycans, but they had, they sequenced and they, they had the um, end sites and they inferred presumably that they were there. And so these are models of the, the change uh, of sites. So you, you know, you've heard of variants with viruses more than enough to know that uh, there are sequence uh, changes. And so, sites are appearing and disappearing with time. So that is a partial explanation for the um, not totally successful uh, treatment with antibodies because the recognition sites are all of a sudden covered with uh, glycans. So the situation is a little bit more complicated with the HIV virus where there are many more potential uh, glycosides. So the envelope protein is really very, very much camouflaged under the, um, the glycans. And that is also a possible explanation for the, um, the, the, the treatment with antibodies and uh, the fact that the surface is not as accessible as it looks. And guess what? Um, this is actually a small animation that I made from the viral zone. Uh, so the entry of the virus into the host is very much mediated by glycans. And this is what we are trying to uh, understand. And of course, in SARS-CoV-2, this is usually the way you are shown the, um, uh, the spike protein. And this is actually how it was modeled by um, a, a, a group of people in uh, UCSD in collaboration with um, Maynooth University. Carl, hello. And this uh, view, which I uh, told Lisa, who is uh, working on, on this, uh, she made that view when it looks like a, a nanodrone picture of the, uh, of the spike protein. And this is actually the virus view, uh, I mean, the host view of, of the virus. And so it's really covered. And it's interesting to see that very often this information you have so far 22 N sites and 20 O sites that have been mapped on the, um, so it's, it's really covered with uh, glycans. So what is interesting is that uh, we have a, a Twitter 
community and there is this um, um, uh, spearhead of, <laughs> of our uh, interactions on Twitter talking about glycobiology and the importance of glycans. So Gordon Lauk, who has, um, he's a professor at Zagreb University and has a company um, doing glycan profiling. And um, he is defending, of course, very strongly the viewpoint of not showing the spike protein as people usually show it without the single uh, sugar. And so in an exchange between Gordon and some other researcher, the, um, the, the question, of course, of the interactions with also the receptors that are at the surface of the host and also heavily glycosylated. So how does this all work with the glycans interfering? And uh, you may uh, not uh, know, but the, uh, the extremely flexible at the surface of cells because they are sort of um, uh, waving uh, in the wind uh, created by the um, the liquid, I suppose. And so this is um, a real conundrum that is often brushed under the carpet. And there's a lot of questions that remain unanswered and that um, should be considered a bit more uh, seriously. Or it's not that it's not serious, but it's uh, not looked at enough from our perspective. So, sorry. What um, I'm going to uh, talk about now is the last part on Glyconnect and the reason why, of course, I um, mentioned the virus is that we have created dedicated data sets. And the first one we created was the COVID-19 data set, where we actually pulled out from the database everything that is relevant to uh, the study of SARS-CoV-2. So as you can imagine in glycobiology, because of the situation I just explained, there has been a lot of, ref of, of uh, publications on <clears throat> um, mapping the glycome and uh, seeing uh, different uh, situations and here. So of course, with our terminology, as, as I explained yesterday, uh, taxonomy is too, because we have uh, the human and uh, the virus. We have nine proteins uh, because, um, as I mentioned yesterday, we consider each recombinant protein, depending on the expression system, uh, as, a, as a different entry. So I'll show you, I'll, I'll make a little demo after that anyway. Um, so we have different sources, of course, because we have different cell lines. We also integrate the receptor um, information when we have it. And so you can see that we have a lot of structures which correspond to quite a few composition as well. There's one disease, of course, and uh, this is just uh, building up when we have um, <clears throat> a new information from a new paper, we try to um, include it. So I'll show you a few things after that. I'll finish on the special data sets and, um, and we'll demo uh, a bit uh, after. HMOs, that's human uh, milk oligosaccharides. And so, Often, again, when you have the composition of, uh, of milk, whether it's cow's milk or human milk, um, you are told that you have a lot of fat and a lot of caseins and, um, and um, you, you are told that there's lactose, but lactose is a little bit more complicated than that. And there are quite a few molecules based on lactose. So you can see here the lactose, which is just the glucose and the galactose here is common everywhere, but there are variation on the theme. And uh, what is actually uh, the situation in the database at the moment is that by looking at a lot of references, uh, we are reaching quite a number of structures that correspond to um, uh, 
uh, to these uh, molecules. And um, it's not related to disease. On the contrary, it's supposed to be a sign of good health uh, because it's uh, fighting uh, microbes in all likelihood. We also have a link to a resource which is called the glycologue, which I will also just uh, show you briefly. So we are developing the HMO module of the glycologue with a team. So Andrew McDonald is, um, you have seen his face yesterday. He's partially in my group and partially um, in uh, Dublin at the uh, Trinity College working with uh, Gavin Davey. And they both have uh, worked and, and developed the glycologue, but we focus on HMOs together. And I'll show you how a bit later. And just to explain why that might be really interesting, uh, you can see the sort of papers that are relating uh, the microbiome uh, and HMOs and the fact that there's a high chance of HMO uh, playing a role, an intermediary role uh, with fighting uh, pathogens in, um, in the microbiome, in the milk microbiome. And so, of course, uh, and maybe you, you have not heard of that, but there's already one uh, HMO which has been uh, accepted by the FDA and that is now part, maybe one or two, uh, part of the formula um, for the milk for babies uh, with, of course, the idea that it's uh, bringing protection uh, for, for, the, for the baby. So there's more and more uh, research. There's um, controversies on the number of, uh, we, we are probably, we have taken a, a wide array of papers and maybe they are over uh, optimistic in the numbers that they have, but uh, this is the situation as it is, and we keep on going. So with the O monosaccharide, um, this is also a completely different distribution. As you can see, we have a lot of species, many more proteins, a lot of sources, but not very <laughs> much structures. And the reason why is that um, these are not very interesting structurally speaking. They're just one monosaccharide attached to uh, a residue, uh, often uh, a serine or threonine, uh, but also tryptophan. So different residues than usual. And they have very, like, I mean, they, they, it's proven that they have a modul uh, modulatory role um, at, at uh, the surface of, um, of proteins. And the, the most famous one is the uh, ogluknac. And uh, ogluknacylation is now very widespread. It was told, uh, it was said before that it was um, competing on serine and threonine with phosphorylation. So there's antagonism between the two modification. And there's now some databases that are focused only on ogluknac. So we had some data from partners that we integrated. Uh, we will probably not put in that much more, but refer to these uh, atlases. But it's interesting to, to have this um, uh, ofucosylation, for instance, all these different um, small glycan monosaccharides that play a role functionally at the surface of protein. And then the last one we have recently integrated is the human immunoglobulins. And again, um, the amount of glycosylation at the surface of immunoglobulin is massive. Uh, the most studied are uh, IgG and IgA1, but there's uh, more and more you can see that for IgM it's uh, quite a challenge. And uh, what of course is interesting in the case of immunoglobulin is that you have variation. So this, there's only one site uh, on each chain of the IgG here 
uh, on the heavy chain and it's it's um, I mean it's been for decades it's been mapped and remapped in different contexts and uh, especially um, adversity effects uh, for monoclonal antibodies you have to have the right glycosylation for the antibody to be um, effective so there are companies who have been created for the quality control of this uh, glycosylation which is really important there's probably around uh, 70 or 80 possibilities of structures at the surface uh, I mean, this is what we have in, in the database, more or less. And what is interesting is to, of course, um, measure the, the quantity of each of the possible structures, especially those that are galactosylated or silylated or fucosylated. So all of these properties can be quantified. And this is the only way to... Uh, make sense of the situation if we have quantitative data. So this is really the objective of GlyConnect for 2021 and the uh, beginning of 2022, to have some profiling, at least of IgG, to, to show the in different conditions, different disease condition, different tissue conditions, how uh, the variation are impacting the, the function. So what it really shows, and I borrow this um, image from um, Joe Zaya, who is a microbiologist in, in Boston. Um, he, he suggests, and he has been pushing me to, to having GlyConnect uh, a, a representation that would be like this, where the, the protein is described with each of its uh, sites, and each site you have the uh, relative quantities of uh, the, the different structures, the different glycans that are sitting there, whether they're O-linked or N-linked. So probably with N-linked, it would be easier considering the data that we have and what is published. But at the moment, not so much is published on this uh, site-specific quantification, not in many proteins, at least certainly in immunoglobulins. And this is why we focus on it. So, of course, the idea is that it's uh, tissue dependent. So each time this has to be as a function of the protein and the expression. And of course, we need the tools for that. So we're working at it. And you can see that we would have data also for the spike protein. The, this is the first paper. It's still bioarchived or, or maybe um, just accepted, I don't know, that was released a, a couple of months ago. Um, and it's, um, it's really the site-specific quantification of the, of the spike protein sites. So you see that's really um, a, a key aspect of what we're doing at the moment that is missing and that needs to be integrated. So, before I move to that, I would like to um, show you live those different uh, data sets. Um, and for instance, if I look at the proteins of this particular site, you see that there is the receptor here, ACE2, uh, that we have, which is very glycosylated. So we have two references that actually talk about it um, and mention the, um, uh, the composition. So you can actually browse and have a look at that. And here are the different sites where um, uh, the different spike proteins. So this is expressed in this cell line. This is expressed in Cho cells. This is expressed in a certain type of uh, HEC293. And we even distinguish when the HEC293 are not the same um, because uh, this is a, a different, you, you are p p potentially um, uh, familiar with the Cellosaurus. The Cellosaurus is the, the new 
uh, most recent and most uh, comprehensive um, database of cell lines and uh, the actual accession number for the freestyle 293F is different from the HEC3. Uh, here, this is uh, 0045, and here, this is uh, D603. So we make sure we're not putting everything in the same basket. We can compare that with Compositor, and uh, this is why we, we distinguish. So we have um, here, uh, you have only two structures because it's only the mapping of oocytes. So that was done with only um, a gal um, or a, a core one uh, oglycan. And uh, we, we can yet compare this. Um, there's a few others with uh, oglycans, with uh, more, more detailed oglycans. So I have actually pre-computed some um, some data on um, on COVID to, to show you. So for instance, the difference between um, the, no, where is the difference between the heck? Uh, no, that was it. Yes, this is the difference between the, so this BTITN blah, 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 is an insect cell. And this is HEC 293. So I've taken all the insights, so you can see there's quite a, a list of them here. And this is the uh, mapping between the two. And you can see that the blue nodes are the insect cell, the red nodes are the um, HEC 293. So the partition is relatively clear that you have all the uh, HEC 293 in that area, you have the, the blue in that area, and you have the common ones, like, uh, for instance, the usual um, uh, suspects in the high manos, oligomanos that are there. So there's a bit more uh, here. And uh, around here, we have uh, just a, a few constellated versions. Uh, so you can see that there is a bias according to the distribution here uh, towards neutral for the insect cell, whereas the neutral are less in the um, HEC and you have more fucosylated and silylated and uh, sometimes both in the uh, HEC. So it's a trend. Of course, the partition is not absolutely uh, clear cut, but uh, you can see obvious trend. So glycosylation in the insect cell is not the same as glycosylation is in the, um, uh, in the model uh, HEC 293 cell line. So I had another example, which is here with um, the RBD uh, domain that was singled out. So there's also the difficulty of expressing the, uh, the spike protein, of course, is a number of subunits. So sometimes you have subunits expressed uh, together or not. Some domains expressed um, or sing singled out. So here we have uh, different papers and uh, one is expressing in Cho cells, the other one in two, um, uh, 293, the RB RBD domain. And then this is the, um, uh, the, the, the control or the, the reference, the basis. And you can see again that if you consider the, um, uh, the, the full protein being expressed or the RBD domain being expressed, you don't have uh, necessarily the same expression. And if you express the RBD in HEC293 or in CHO, you don't have uh, the same results either. So you have in the middle the common uh, the common structures that are there. So they are all obviously um, containing a lot of um, uh, of Gruknex, and uh, and then 
it's a, it's a matter I'm, I'm not going to, uh, you, you see the, the distribution there where you have here, uh, uh, obviously a bias towards a fucosylated here, a bias towards uh, neutral. And then um, you have more high manos uh, in this one and, and so on. So compositor is just bringing out these differences uh, and, and then it's for the biologist or the virologist to interpret and see uh, what system is more relevant to use to express uh, the protein, et cetera, et cetera. I also did a, a comparison at the site level. So looking, for instance, at um, uh, in the insect cell and in the HEC293 cell, for one particular site, so the um, asparagine 122 is particularly uh, glycosylated, and you can see that the partition is actually uh, reproduced, where we have the uh, the different distribution, the bias towards neutral, and um, for for the insect cell. And I think I have yet another. Uh, I did also the freestyle, the HEC 293, and uh, with, with um, ASN 165. And again, you see some trends and partition different, uh, though comparable uh, distribution between um, uh, B and C. B and C are a bit more overlapping, uh, which is hopeful because they are uh, somehow a, der a derivative or, of, uh, of one. And um, uh, this is again food for thought and seeing that uh, you, you have a, a tendency to recognize rather one or the other type of sugars uh, of glycans if you use an expression system or another. I can see there's something in the chat. Uh, no, there is no glycosylation of native. Uh, as far as I know, I mean, we, we can uh, check again because uh, we, we are not but that would be that would be ideal. That would be ideal. So what we have there's a very interesting paper, and that is relate related to the uh, glycosylation of immunoglobulins. So they have found with some uh, native isolate that the the actually I should say that the uh, freestyle is the closest. To the native, they, they try to to um, to get to the in, in the closest conditions to um, to native, but uh, the, to go back to the antibodies, um, they have found by testing some uh, um, different type of um, uh, samples and associated with more or less severe. Uh, symptoms that the more the more severe symptoms, the antibodies that are actually binding the virus are more heavily fucosylated. I leave it to you to think about it. If you're interested in the paper, I can dig it out for you. But that's uh, that's an interesting point. So this is on from the point of view of the antibody. So. The, the immune system is working with a lot of components and um, because the glycans are not always taken into account, it's interesting to see that there are uh, seeds of uh, explanation for a number of, um, of phenomena. And th there is also a paper uh, of people who have tried the, the different vaccines and the effect with glycosylation of the different vaccines, which is an important paper as well. If you're interested, I have that in my uh, list. Okay, 
So this is for COVID. Okay, I will count. <laughs> um, this is for COVID. Uh, I'll go quickly on the um, uh, so the I'll go quickly on the um, all monosaccharides you've already seen uh, the uh, the structures that I showed. So um, you can see here, for instance, that uh, O fucosylation is in uh, a number of uh, different uh, species. You can see that here we have only um, slime mode for, for this one, but the ogluknak that is here is listed in uh, different uh, organisms, uh, including uh, viruses. Uh, you have here the first one, um, which is only in... Um, uh, so you see that we distinguish when we know the linkage and sometimes we don't know the linkage. Uh, this is sometimes C-linked. We are not quite sure whether we can distinguish uh, the C or the O linked, uh, so sometimes it's ambiguous. So again, if you if you doing um, if you are um, uh, into protein and proteomics and you looking at PTMs, um, all of this um, these difference. So needless to say, there's a uh, this has. If I go to the structure, we have the mass data for these, and they are well known. And, um, and you can see that it makes a difference in your peptide if it's modified uh, like that. So that is for monosaccharides. So, and if I go to the human Ig at the moment, um, we have, so this is really the work of, um, of Catherine, uh, who is helping me um, with the course. Uh, she has gone through a number of references. As you can see, um, the, the um, immunoglobulin, so it's only human, uh, are described. Um, so we have papers until 2021 goes down, uh, so this is relatively recent, and we have older ones as well. And um, we have in the proteins, so we distinguish uh, the chains, so you can have, uh, of course, we have uh, IgG, and there are four genes for IgG, this is gamma 1, gamma 2, gamma 3, so there are some old papers you can see here, uh, we have relatively uh, old papers from the 1990s down to 1987. And so at the time, you probably know the uh, human genome was not sequenced and it was not necessarily known that there were so many uh, genes for IgG. Um, so, and uh, maybe it was known, but it was not e easy to uh, associate the data. So when we have of course, uh, the uh, it's actually specified. Uh, we we take uh, gamma one, gamma two, gamma three. Uh, so we we have this distinct uh, entries for for that. So, and uh, you can see for each of them, uh, more or less, uh, you have uh, forty structures here, forty two here, thirty six. So this is the average, uh, fifty for. Oh, this is for delta. Um, so you see, there's a, there's a really broad uh, collection here and um, with, uh, with different, so we have a few um, hybrid, as you could see, I think, uh, here. Uh, or maybe we didn't keep the hybrid there. No, we don't. It's in the database. Okay, so here... Uh, for the last, uh, for the HMOs, um, it's a different section and really, as you saw, 
protein zero because they all free um, oligosaccharides. Yet we have um, in Glyconnect, you can look at the milk um, and you will see that we have a lot of proteins. So there are some recent papers, especially from uh, the uh, Albert Heck lab uh, that, that did a, a really extensive end glycoproteome of human milk. So we got a lot of um, structures and proteins from human milk that are described. So it's all mixed here with the lactose, with everything. So this is why we created the uh, special um, section for HMO so that we see only the free ones. And um, if I go to one of them, uh, like this one possibly, we have, so this is a, a typical one. Um, so we have four references that are actually describing it. Yeah, I should, I should add. So sometimes like we have these complicated ones and um, there's only, uh, there's one reference that usually describes the more, uh, the more complicated ones, but still uh, it doesn't matter. Uh, it's, uh, but it's always more comforting when you have four references or more than one reference that actually establishes the, uh, the existence of a particular uh, molecule. So here we are linked to the glycolog, as I mentioned. So um, this is the, um, the, the way uh, the, uh, the, the molecule is represented there with the orientation. Uh, we've seen that uh, yesterday afternoon. And so you can have the pathway. And then the idea is to have the mapping and have the, uh, like the, the glycogenes I mentioned yesterday. So all the enzymes, so this is alpha-3 uh, fucose T that actually synthesizes this reaction. Same, you have ST, uh, ST3-GAL3 uh, that synthesizes this one. So we have the list of enzymes and uh, the, the purpose of the glycolog is not only to re reconstitute the molecule step by step, but also to um, simulate how many structures can you actually build with that set of enzymes? And why do we have only 200 or 260 when you can actually create millions of them? So maybe not millions, but at least um, quite a, a few thousand. And so there are some rules. So Andrew McDonald is a, is a biochemist. He knows his endemology by heart. And so he's applied some rules for not uh, using any old uh, reaction in any old way. And so we are currently working on the simulation uh, it would take a while to explain what we're doing. We're trying to write the paper at the moment, um, but I'm just uh, saying this is this is one of the purposes of what we're doing with HMO. So possibly to help synthesis, having some synthetic HMO that maybe are not found, but that could uh, have a role, an interesting role, especially in uh, blocking pathogens. So um, what else did I want to say about these? I think uh, this is it. Um, so it would make sense that I would have a little bit of a break now before I, I start. Oh, yes, there's one thing I thought yesterday that I didn't tell you uh, that I think was in one of the exercises, but for those who don't do the exercise and look at um, uh, the compositor and the fact that if you take um, actually any uh, protein and you have, uh, for instance, so we have by default the serotransferrin uh, because it, it's, um, it's actually um, quite uh, 
the, the glycome is quite extended and there's a number of papers again that are um, documenting this glycosylation so here you go um, so I wanted to make a point about virtual node uh, which I didn't um, really insist. Ab I mean, I, I told you yesterday in the presentation how virtual nodes um, are, can be actually confirmed with further experiments and, uh, and further paper included in the database. And what we usually do to actually see whether a virtual node makes sense or doesn't make sense uh, there's a very simple procedure that I wanted to show you, which is to select the virtual nodes here, to copy them, to go to the custom and paste here. So these are my 10 VN and they are N linked here. So I add them to the selection. The the reason why it's taking a while is that uh, it's actually going to uh, through the whole database to see whether these different uh, compositions, uh, what they correspond to. So it's dragging the, the whole database with these composition to find out whether they have map matching structures. And so that's why it takes a little bit longer. However, it has an end, I can assure. And it's highlighting then in your, um, in your network. the virtual nodes, whether I include them or not is, is not making any difference. It's not gonna find any new. Sorry, it takes a while. Okay. Maybe Frederick, um, uh, just on the virtual nodes, just the example of Catherine down in Australia. Um, we oh, had yeah. we had done a, a graph like this. If you want to, that's a really good example of how it works. Sure. I. Um, but she had, and but she she has challenged um, our definition of um, of virtual node in the sense that she found a, a two step. Um, I think it has happened. No, uh, she has found a two step. Um, oh, no, even I, I I kept it. It's open here. So what she did is that um, I sent her a, um, a compositor um, network uh, graph asking her to justify uh, a virtual node. So they, they are the virtual are in the red here, exactly the way I would like to see them here and it's not happening. Um, but the, um, I said, I have, you, you told me you have this composition, you have this composition and this composition. And um, my uh, compositor suggests this intermediary or this intermediary possibility to bridge between H7N4S1 and H6N3S1 that you have identified. And she suggested, she went back to the raw data. She looked in the mass, uh, mass spectra and she could actually find another path 
here that go through H6N4, H7N4 and back to. Uh, so there was indeed um, something that she, this node without those virtual node was isolated and it was not making sense. That so she found in the data um, a two-step process for connecting H3, H6N3 with H7N4S1. Problem is, as I said, we, uh, we, um, we're doing only one step at a time. If we start putting two steps, we're going to have uh, overpopulated graphs and it's going to be crazy. So we need some rules. So I'm working with actually this person in Australia um, trying to see how we could constrain and open the possibility of putting two virtual nodes, um, but in very strict uh, conditions so that we can possibly make sense of linking two nodes that are not linked. And in the meanwhile, it happened. Thank you, Catherine. So, so you can see here that you have the red nodes that are the, the 10 um, composition that were virtual node before. So I don't have any virtual nodes anymore. And um, I can justify nine of them because they happen to actually correspond to existing structures here or there. So in all likelihood, they could be there. Maybe, maybe not, but it's a fair assumption to think. And so maybe it's also a fair assumption to privilege this one, which is more common uh, in comparison to this one, which is less common, but who knows? This one here is not associated with any um, data in the database. So as, as I've said before, of course, the database is not uh, foolproof and um, and uh, it's biased and uh, we don't have, uh, it's not comprehensive. So it could be that this correspond to a structure. However, it's a new GC. So this is probably uh, a bionic identification. And um, then I would consider to ignore that virtual node because it is not bringing more. And this would be uh, connecting what I need to have connected. And it's actually related to a number of structures. So this is like a quality check. Once you have a glycome that has virtual node, um, the export here only of the virtual node, well, not in that case, because there, there's no more, um, and pasting it in the custom tab is a, is, a, is a good quality check for the reality of the, of the virtual node. If you don't have someone at hand in Australia who is going to go through the mass spectra and find, uh, dig out what is missing. Okay. I've said everything I wanted to say about Glyconnect. And the idea now for the second part of this morning is to concentrate on glycan binding. Unless you have burning questions on Glyconnect or Compositor or anything else. 